Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Classes of Mail. My name is Alan Gigax, and I am still recording from the convention. You can probably hear some background noise as one of the <laughs> classes let out. I just took a class on the NALC Constitution and bylaws, and it's everything I've been learning here is so eye-opening and is hopefully preparing me to become a branch officer in our next election. We'll see how that plays out. But, you know, whatever type of change I'm trying to do and whatever improvements I'm trying to make, they hail in comparison to the work of national activist Tyler Vassar. Tyler, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Alan. Good to be here. All right. So Tyler is from is Branch 9, right, in right. Minnesota. Yep. Tyler is a steward, and Tyler is the spiritual and practical leader of the Build a Fighting NALC movement. There have been meetings here, there's been organization here, there have been people handing out buttons. It's like a real bona fide political movement, and it stems from your activism. So one of the first things I want to know is, how did this get started for you as far as being a an NALC activist? Like, what was the first issue that you took up? Well, first of all, Alan, nice to meet you in person. You really got a oh, voice yeah. for radio. I, Indeed. Uh, Indeed. I think you probably well, heard that Well, when you look before. like this, you have to. <laughs> Thanks, I appreciate it. First issue I um, I really got involved with at the post office that got me interested in being more involved in the union was uh, the experience of being a CCA. I started back in 2018. I was making right. 1676 an hour. Um, I was excited and, and to get the job. what year was that? 2018, yeah. When I started as a PTF in 2006, yeah. that's what I was making. Yeah, exactly. And the, yeah. the, the cost of living is a little different in those... It is a little different, in those, yeah. uh, ...in that decade right. plus... It was my experience of being a CCA. I mean, the lack of adequate pay was one of the things, absolutely. But the bigger thing was the lack of dignity, dignity and respect that you feel as a CCA, getting thrown around from route to route, never knowing your hours. You come in in the morning, yeah. you don't know when you're going to be able to go home. That is the almost, if not worse, it's just as bad as a lack of adequate pay because I experience it every day with the new, new hires. I mean, and people are getting hired as PTFs. They still get mandatory overtime. They still get thrown around. They still get their hold downs broken. Um, but yeah, it was really my experience as a CCA and really that, that, that sense of injustice that really made me want to fight. I mean, it also made, felt me, I felt defeated. I wanted to quit. I almost quit a couple of times. But instead, I started going to union meetings um, and got involved and started talking with other carriers and thought that we can really change something here. Right. So with that, it's something that most of us have gone through. In my own experience, when I started back in 2006, I had a stretch of about a month and a half where I didn't have a single day off at all. Oh my Seven God. days a week. And there are a lot of people out there experiencing mm -hmm. that. And what I see is two attitudes about that from old timers. Mm -hmm. One is, well, it was shitty for me, and so it's going to be shitty for you. And like that's the way of the world, and that's the way it should be. But people like you and I push back against that. Mm -hmm. I want better for the people who come after me. And that's supposed to be what this union is about. Exactly. That we don't just fight for wages. We fight for working conditions. Mm -hmm. And we fight for better for the exactly. people who come into this union, and that's not happening. The CCAs today have a way worse deal than the people who came in, you know, the old-timers who were here at the convention voting on things. Mm -hmm. So what form did that activism take place? Being a CCA got you upset, mm -hmm. so what did you start doing about it? Uh, I mean, I started going to union meetings. There you go. Um, but in, even before that, I started talking to other CCAs, um, Reading about, honestly, reading about labor history, about our own union's history, about right. other unions, and really seeing that history has a way of repeating itself. This isn't the first time that uh, workers have been screwed over and that people have decided to try to, that something needs to be done about it. Last night at the Build a Fighting in ALC meeting, mm -hmm. you said something that I found really impactful, and I want you to repeat it here, and that was putting this, putting our movement here in context of the broader labor movement, where people fought for that eight-hour work day. Talk about That's that right. a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think sometimes you are a part of the AFL-CIO. It's a broader labor federation of, I don't know, 20 or 30 other unions. Um, there are other unions. We talk about labor solidarity. We talk about an injury to one is an injury to all, all the time. But I think that those things can sometimes just sound like words. What does that actually look like? I think something's happening here in our society. In the last couple of years, especially a couple of years after COVID, people have really decided that, you know, they're sick of low wages, they're sick of getting screwed over, they're sick of bullying and harassment and at work, they're right. sick of unsafe working conditions, and they're starting to get organized to fight back, and there's unions 
over the last couple of years who have gone on strike, who have organized campaigns, who have, you know, publicly right. fought and organized the membership to fight for something better. And I think that everything that we do, we should think about ourselves in that context and seek to, to connect with these other unions in order to, to fight because we're stronger together. It's not just a platitude. That it's, it's a reality. Absolutely, that's true. The, the one thing from that that really stuck with me is you said, like, people fought and died for the eight-hour workday. Yeah. And we've completely given it away. Yeah. And now it's just standard. Even people who sign up for eight hours only yeah. do not get to work eight hours only. And the reality is that yeah. at, our, at, at the post office, if you're working eight hours management, regularly getting an eight-hour day, management looks at you sideways and thinks, hmm, you right. must have undertime. Yeah, that's yeah, not you're how doing it something should be. wrong. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. And eight hours should be the standard. Mm-hmm. That is the workday that the labor movement – and the NALC is one of the biggest and strongest unions in the country – And we don't act like it. You know, the whole idea that we have to have a movement, I know Corey said this too, that we have to have a movement called Build a Fighting NALC. How is that not already the standard? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, that's just, that's the reality is I, you know, I really, I think sometimes people can automatically, if you say that I don't like what's happening, we want to change things. I think people can take that really personally. People who've been around for a long time and said, hey, I've been, I've been here and I've been fighting and I want to say, um, we're not attacking absolutely every single person who's in a position of a leadership position right, right now. There are a lot of people who have been been around for a long time who've tried to keep up the fight and are now, you know. And the reality is, um, more people are, are one, for one, more people are starting to get involved. But for two, it's um, the reality is uh, things have started to get worse. And even if even, even against the best intentions of people who've been around to fight, and um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny because the CLC movement is a pushback against the entrenched power and against these old guard forces. And the great irony, you, you make a great point that not everybody who's in these positions, we're not saying they're all bad. And James Henry is a good example of this sure. because he is the national vice president. Mm-hmm. And so you would think, oh, he's one of the good old boys. He's not going to have any integrity. Yeah, yeah. But whenever I talk to people about why they support James Henry, the first word they always use is integrity. Mm-hmm. And when I was at the, the CLC planning meeting in Las Vegas, people went around the room and talked about their experience being mistreated by the post office. Mm-hmm. And we had leaders in that movement who have been in the post office since the 70s and since the Zimbrado days talking about management was treating people so bad, like in San Diego, that carriers were committing suicide. Yeah. And that still happens. And it's just amazing to me the dysfunction from the top to the bottom in this work environment. But what's more disheartening, and this is what I want you to speak to, is we get mistreated by management. And some of it is the nature of the relationship. Mm -hmm. But we're also being mistreated by our own union. And we shouldn't have to fight against our own union to have better working conditions to make positive change. So tell me when you started this activism, there was probably an old guard, even in your own branch, Mm -hmm. how generally Mm -hmm. was your activism received? Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, there are. So, I mean, when I first started, first couple things I did in the union was really small things. There was a teacher strike in Minneapolis. And I brought forward a resolution to, that we should publicly support. Them. We should donate to their strike fund. It's a great that idea. We should get out. We should encourage our members to get out to their picket line, that there are other public sector workers that we need to support publicly in whatever way that we can. Yeah, we're working a lot of hours, but we should at least, at the very least, a, a statement of support and encourage right. them. There was a couple yeah. of union drives. There was workers at Trader Joe's in Minneapolis that were organizing an independent union, whatever, and a couple other things. And I didn't really know what I was doing, but I brought these things forward and a section of, or do you want to call them the old guard? Yeah, I mean, a section sure. of longtime members, former, a couple of former branch presidents, they immediately grabbed me after the meeting and said, this is really good. You should, you know, we should, oh, that's great. We should do more of this. And, uh, you know, because a lot of them were like, we haven't seen a fight in this union in a decade right. or two. That you little know? spark of what was in there, that union mm-hmm. fight still left, started to activate. Exactly. And they have that, <laughs> they have that institutional knowledge. I, right. you know, I was just saying before we started recording, Alan, that what we need to do is we need to combine the knowledge and experience of the older generation with the energy and the, the energy and activism of the younger generation. Right. And that is how we build the strongest union possible. If we just, you know, if, otherwise it's just going to be one or the other. And that's, that's not how you... 
we have a retiree section for a reason, but let's use it for that reason, which is to use that experience. There you go. So you, when you started your activism, it was actually pretty well received by your branch. I think so. And I think that's most, excellent. I think, I think um, the most important thing is that you've got to be a good steward first. You've got to mm. be a good, before that, you've got to be a good carrier. If I, was a bad, go. if I was a bad carrier, I was calling in sick all the time. I was, you know, not delivering half my route. Yeah. I was constantly giving people extra because I was dragging my feet, but stuff like that. Right. If you're not a good carrier, and if I was a, not a good steward, if I was right. not filing the grievance that I, that I needed to, uh, why would anyone listen to me about right. you broader things? you wouldn't have that credibility. That and just to be clear, I've only been a steward for a couple of years. I have a lot to learn. Right. Half the time someone comes up to me with an issue, I call the office right. or I call one of the formal A reps yeah. and I say, and I, I'm not going to... I'm not going to BS with anyone. I'm not going to sit, I'm not going to make something up. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, Carrie asked me the question. I don't know the answer. I'm going to get back to you later today, you know, and right. on my route, I'm calling, yeah, I'm calling the office it. and I'm learning because it's a learning experience. And right. so yeah. the honesty with your fellow members is critical, mm-hmm. right? Building that credibility. And you know, another thing about being good, um, being a good carrier, I've spoken a lot this week at, or this week with David Grosskopf out of Buffalo. Mm-hmm. He was at your meeting last night That's as well. Right. gave a fantastic speech. I think so. Yeah, he's a good guy. And he talks about building public support. I know that's a big part of open bargaining and where mm-hmm. you're trying to go. And honestly, being a good carrier is critical to that as well. Yeah. Because if we want to build these bonds with the public, then you can't ignore somebody when they come up and try to give you a parcel yeah, yeah you yeah, have yeah. to be like oh thank you for the parcel i'm happy to take it even if you're on your lunch break and you're that's a little right. annoyed i roll the yeah. window down like, how you doing yeah, yeah i'll take that exactly. for you no problem right that's part of what we're trying to build here because we have to have that public support going forward if we want to engage with the public make mm-hmm. sure they're on our side then we all have an obligation to yeah. be the servants to the public that we're going to say we are when it's time to engage them for better bargaining. Exactly. Yeah, I definitely agree. All right. So all of this eventually builds into build a fighting in ALC, mm-hmm. BFN. Mm-hmm. Where does that transition happen? How, like how did it get started? Yeah, yeah. Them? Or was open bargaining the first yeah, yeah. issue? Okay, so let's start with that. When you yeah. turn from just small union things like support. And by the way, I love the idea of just like starting out with a show of support for another union because that doesn't cost anything, you know, exactly. and it's something that seems really easy to approve. What, mm-hmm. what a great way to start reactivating that union spark. Okay. So we go from there to open bargaining. How does mm-hmm. that transition happen? Yeah. So first of all, it was, it was Tim, another carrier in branch nine, Tim Bash and I wrote, co-wrote the open bargaining resolution okay. and, you know, worked along a couple of, with a couple other carriers. I wasn't just the only one that just right. came up with this out of nowhere. We worked as a, as a group to bring it forward in branch nine, but we started with open bargaining because we thought we've got to do something. We've got to bring something to the, to the convention next year that will get people thinking about how we can do contract negotiations differently, how we can activate the membership, how we can actually put up some sort of fight, how we can build right. leverage. Of course. Um, and so we brought that forward at the November, it was November of 2023 was the branch meeting, the general membership meeting where we brought that forward. After that, um, we thought, you know, hey, it's one thing for one branch to bring a resolution forward, but can we get other branches signed on, signed right. on to this? Yeah. Can we, we thought, you know, we knew that the convention is, you know, it's, it's, we, it's not, it's not as representative of the fuller membership as it as it as it could be. Sure, I'm not trying to you know talk poorly of anyone, but like there are the reality is the vast majority of members currently are not active. We're trying to oh change without that. question. We're trying yeah. to change that, and once we get that, the the delegates will be more representative of of the broader membership. Mm-hmm. And so we we thought we have to we have to do everything we can to build this up before we get to the convention, so that people aren't hearing about it for the first time, right there. Right. And you can be sure that people have absolutely heard about yeah. open bargaining yeah, at this right. point. Right. And how many resolutions are in our booklet? As, so in the as booklet, so first yeah. of all, I got, you know, I've, I always encourage people, send me, let me know so I can keep a list mm-hmm. when you've passed open bargaining. Send me the signed, you know, resolution right. with, from you. <coughs> Excuse me. And I, had, I got 44 branches and two state associations to pass, pass, to pass it and send it to me. They Most passed the exact wording for branch nine. Right. Some of them, the wording got tweaked a little bit, which is technically a different resolution, but I still said right. in, in essence, 44 branches passed open bargaining. Not all of them knew where to send it. So not all of them send it in, sent it into right. the, I think they thought you send it to Tyler and then it'll be in the booklet. But, right. Right. Tyler will take it. Yeah. No, you yeah. send it to the secretary treasurer <laughs> or is that, is that what it is? Yeah. Uh, which that Nicole, right. Nicole Ryan. Recording secretary. Recording secretary. Like yeah. That. Yeah. Anyways. Um, but in the booklet, 
the identical language to Branch 9's original open bargaining resolution. It's, what is it, 29 to 30 branches and a state association. Okay. Have passed. That's the one that has the big <clears throat> list That's after right. it. So you look uh, in the booklet and there's a yes. big list of all these branches. No right. other resolution in the booklet has more than one, sometimes two, right. signed on. And um, I think it just shows um, what can be done if you if you put forward ideas that people want to fight for. Absolutely. So I kind of got sidetracked from my question. Yeah, that's right. Which was, <laughs> so, so you propose it at your own branch, and that's fine, and, and mm-hmm. now you're done. How do you now spread it out? Yeah, um, so I mean, I much prefer to be in person, but there mm-hmm. are the wonders of, of the internet and, and right. the modern world that we organize Zoom meetings. Okay. And the first Zoom meeting... First of all, we bothered Corey with incessant emails and text messages. <laughs> hey, Corey, can we get on the podcast? We passed this resolution. We think people right. will really like to hear it. You know, he had at that time absolutely the most listened to letter carrier podcast. Oh, it still is. It still is. As but, far as I know, I'm the second most popular. There you go. And he has like 10 times the listeners yeah, that yeah, I have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so um, we thought, okay, we should do a Zoom meeting to, to build support for open bargaining, encourage people to pass it. But first, got to get on information arbitration so that we can make the call out there for – the Zoom meeting. So we get on right. the from eight arbitration. We organize the first Zoom meeting. I think we had 107 people. Dude. Modest, but very exciting. Yeah. 107 people on that first call. And um, we wanted to see if other branches would pass it. And I think, yeah, it was it, – from right. there, it kind of just took off, you know. In the That's next in, within between In the month between the first Zoom meeting and the second Zoom meeting, I think it was something like a half dozen to a dozen branches had passed. It just continuously grew up to the right. point that we got to. So when when this process is happening and it's starting to grow – do you did you envision was this like the pipe dream that that you would be at the convention that you'd be on the mic that people would know your name <laughs> and we're going to get to the the adoption in just a second oh, so sure. don't don't get to that but the the strength of the mm-hmm. movement you know was this did you think this would really happen I think it's um we got to look at what's necessary necessary to transform this union yeah. and it became very clear that it wasn't just an issue with how we conduct negotiations. Right. It wasn't just an issue of needing open bargaining. It was an issue of like, oh, we need a broader set of ideas, a broader program to activate the membership of our union to get to get right. n- newer carriers involved, to get longtime carriers who weren't active involved. You know, and so I think um, it quickly became clear that we did need some sort of movement like this, and. Right. Um, uh, I mean, I do enjoy public speaking as much as anyone could say they enjoy it, sure, but it, yeah. the, the point isn't to get up there and you know get a cheer. The point is right. to get up there and, and fight to put forward ideas that can change this union. That's exactly right. Yeah, one of the things that – this is my first convention. I presume it's yours yeah, it's too. Yeah, it's mine as well, yeah. And I didn't realize how malleable the delegates were. You know, most of the time in political uh, – in the political arena, people come in with their preconceived notions, mm-hmm. and that's what they're going to do. But because of the way um, the amendments are put forward or the resolutions are put forward, in many cases, when it's read at the convention, it's the first time anybody's seeing it. Yeah. And so they don't come in with <laughs> as many um, preconceived notions and a steadfast, well, this is the way I'm going to vote on this. Yeah. They may have an idea, but you make the right speech – and you can turn some people. It can really make a difference. It yeah. really can, yeah. And that that's wild to see. And that's definitely, you know, I, unfortunately, I signed up late for this. I didn't know I was going to come. And then James Henry is like, well, you got to come to the convention. And so, all right, I'm at the convention. <laughs> there you go. But I'm only a guest, and so I wasn't sure. able to speak. But you were able to speak and get attention. And I'm assuming you're going to do more speaking today because Absolutely. if we get to it after <laughs> – you know, all this stuff going on with Renfro, but, um, but yeah, it's going to be great. So, so now we're at the convention yep. and the administration, the Renfro administration has been steadfastly against open bargaining, yep. both in thought and in deed. And obviously you guys, all listeners, you know, they don't tell us Jack about what's going on. We don't know what the holdup is. We don't know anything, mm-hmm. you know? And so there's no way that they're going to support any kind of open bargaining. And then there's a change Yeah, coming into the convention. So talk about that. As recently as, what was it, July 14th, there was a mid, there was a, there was a, I'm doing air quotes right now, oh. contract update in right. mid-July. That oh, came yeah, 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 yeah. They came out and it was more of the same. We're right. moving oh, al- we're really close. We're really yeah. close. We're moving along. Right. No spe- nothing specific, just sort of, I mean, comes across as platitudes. Right. Hey, hey, by the way, guys, as of last night, hot off the presses, we're really close to getting an agreement, <laughs> but we're ready to go to arbitration. Yeah, yeah, so consider yeah. yourself updated. All right. And so, anyway. so um, 
you know, for months and months and months, they fought against open bargaining. There was, uh, <laughs> they fought against, excuse me. Yeah. They fought against open bargaining for months and months and months. They sent business agents and, you know, the president and the vice president out to regional trainings across the country to speak right. against it, saying, we've never done something like this. We've always done closed door bargaining. We, uh, we can't tell the, the public will turn against, like, saying all these sorts of things yeah. for months and months and months. I want to talk about some of those points, but and so, continue. Yeah. Until all of a sudden we get the resolutions booklet and we see that there are three versions of open bargaining. Because, again, some branches passed uh, versions of open bargaining that were worded slightly differently. You right. could call them watered down. You could call them... I would absolutely call them watered down. But they came out, and I think they approved three, three versions of open bargaining because they did not... I think there's, a, there's, a quest, there's an issue of credibility right now in the national leadership mm -hmm. amongst the membership. And I, what I, the reason I think they had a... You could call it a change of heart, whatever you want to call it, was because they did not want to lose even more credibility by disapproving everything bringing it all to a floor vote and losing a floor vote on the strongest of the open bargaining you resolutions. You are exactly right. And so they, I, I think they want to cut across it and say, you passed it, now shut up. Right. Well, guess what? We're not going to shut up now. In yep. essence, we've already, as of yesterday, we've all, in essence, we've won open bargaining. Right, because the resolutions that were passed on block, mm -hmm. some of them were open bargaining resolutions. Mm -hmm. The one that you had tried to withdraw, yeah. dude, this is what passed for an open <laughs> bargaining resolution it was, hey, we will tell you all kinds of interesting stuff about our negotiations and what our tax, what we were negotiating for after the resolution is complete, after the contract is done. Then we'll tell you guys stuff. That is like so not the spirit of open bargaining. Exactly. But they also yeah. passed two other versions of open bargaining that called for the need, that called for using our exact language on contract rallies leading up yeah, to negotiations right. and at key points throughout, which technically is on the books right now. What are we doing to organize those rallies? Because yeah, we still right. don't have a contract. Right. We're still happening. We should yeah. need to put up the pressure on them. Right. And called for regular updates, or was it monthly or regular updates on wages, hours, working conditions. That was also in the language of another resolution. So I got up there to try to ask for clarification because in my, in my opinion, are these, are these in conflict with each other? And right. you asked, so the, the person from Massachusetts. And there was not a good answer for the, that. The, the brother from Massachusetts came up and, and gave his explanation of what his resolution meant. Brenfro gave the explanation of the executive council's take on the resolution. And then they asked me, brother, does that make sense? And I said, no, you both said different things. Right. You know, but because of the confusion of what's going on and there was an amendment to an amendment, it, it got really confusing. People ended up just voting for them all. But technically, I think we should still claim victory because after months of being opposed to it, oh, there's we've no won. We, the essence of open bargaining has been won. I think our role doesn't change. What we need to do is keep pressure from below to make sure it's followed through on. Right. Regardless of if we're still going to bring ours forward, the stronger resolution, probably today if we get to it, but at least by Friday, because there is a few differences, but regardless of the, what happens on that vote, we should, we should claim victory. We've won open bargaining in Absolutely. Essence. It was in that block of approved resolutions. Yeah. Yep. So in that discussion about how do we handle these conflicting resolutions, mm -hmm. I found Renfro's answer to be kind of telling, which was, eh, I mean, did not word for word, obviously, but basically, eh, they're recommendations. You know, we kind of take them as, eh, all right, we'll take it under advisement. <laughs> And they're, it's not like they're binding. Yeah. You know, it was, hey, we want the union to do this. And it's still up to the administration to actually do it. Exactly. And that was yeah. that's always been, I think, a, a weakness of the resolutions in general. Because regardless of if the original open bargaining resolution from Brunch right. 9 had passed, even if that one had passed with the stronger language, we still would have, have to, had to build pressure from below to make sure it was followed through on. Right. You know, and so that's that's why, you know, I think we can still claim victory, even though resolutions with slightly watered down language, but the key essence of, of what we originally were fighting for is still right. in there. Yeah. Um, we should still claim victory, but that our work doesn't stop. Now we actually have an opening to say it's on the books. Right. What are we doing about it now? All right. So there's still an attitude against open bargaining because of what people have been hearing from the administration for so long. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you what, in my opinion, is the most common argument against open bargaining, and then you're going to explain to me why that's stupid. <laughs> yeah. All right, here we go. You know, when you're playing poker, you don't just show your hand to your opponent. This, is, this argument has always baffled me, because if you don't think about it at all, maybe you could think, yeah, that makes sense. But think about what was just said there. I've heard that argument before as well. Of course you Think have. about what has been said there. Don't we go into negotiations and tell USPS our demands? Don't we go in and, and, and put forward our list? Or do we go into – are they saying that we go into negotiations and 
and don't tell them what we're asking for. Exactly. Because that's what that's what's implied yep. when they say that. It is. All that we're yeah. not – the only people we're not telling what we're asking for, what we're fighting for are, is the membership. That's exactly right. So you can – I can guarantee you that Brian Renfro has – Said to uh, – what's the other person, the person on the post office side? Do you know their name off the top of your head? Oh, uh, Doug Tolino. That's it, Tolino, yeah. yeah. Brian Renfro has said to Tolino, okay, we want our new hires to be at 3103 an hour. So he'll say it to Tolino but won't say it to us. Exactly. And that's the bullshit, and that's what open bargaining is all about. Now, are you saying with open bargaining – let's clear the record here – are you saying that you want Renfro to say like, well, we're asking for $30, but we'll settle for 27 and we want this, but we'll settle for that. Is that what you want him to do? No, I mean, demands aren't promises. Hi, I don't want to interrupt. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Okay. okay, sorry, we got interrupted there, and we had to give somebody directions because we're sitting <laughs> at a table like we're like we're helpers because yeah. we are helpers, yeah, yeah. and we did help helpers All with right, a microphone. So, so what were we saying? Oh, so the argument. So strategy, yeah. is not what That's, you're asking. This is what I was gonna. Well, yeah, yeah. First of all, I just want to say demands aren't promises. They always That's say right. we don't want to make promises we can't keep. Demands are not promises. They're goals that we collectively fight for. You know, if we say we want a thirty dollar an hour starting wage for new hires with raises, you right. know, for all steps. On top of that, we're not, you know, and we don't make and we don't win thirty dollars. Maybe we win twenty five or twenty eight. We don't. That's not a broken promise. Right. That was a goal that we fought for collectively. Maybe we didn't get all the way there, but next time we say, "What can we do better to create a stronger movement to fight for more next time?" That is what a demand is, first of all. And so, you know, the other thing is like we don't. We're not asking for hundreds of pages of documents saying this is our this is what we're asking for and this is our strategy to fight for it. Right. But the key thing is what are our three, four, five main demands right. which our union used to do? Put those out, get the members mobilized behind them because people – you can't just say, hey – Come to this rally to fight for better wages. What does that mean? Better wa- you know, better wages. The post office would say, "Well, better wages is a dollar an hour raise." Why? Right. Except that you know, you have to you have to be clear. Come to this rally, and we're fighting for. I mean, in BFN with Build a Fighting and ELC, fight for a thirty dollar an hour starting wage. Fight for an end to mandatory overtime. Right. Fight for the right to strike. Things like that. I mean, any aspect of those. We need demands to get people mobilized behind because otherwise, most members will say. I don't know. I've got to take care of my kid, and I got to go to soccer practice, and I got to go to the gym, and I got to go to the right. grocery store. You got to give people a reason to get active. There's also, you know, the secrecy creates a lack of trust, exactly. which is the nature of secrecy. And so there is a, a feeling among the membership that part of the reason that Renfro doesn't want to say what he's asking for is because if he doesn't get it, you know, let's say he's asking for thirty dollars an hour, mm-hmm. and then he gets twenty six. He can say, oh, we fought for 26 and we got it. This is a big victory, mm-hmm. you know, so that whatever the outcome is, they can make themselves look good. Yeah. We don't know what they're really fighting for. Exactly. And I think that just shows the strategy that they have, which is I believe they think the way we get a good contract is having the best negotiators possible. I hope right. and I've be- got to believe they've got the best right. negotiators that we can find. Yep. But it's actually – that's not enough to win a strong contract. you got to build leverage. you got to build pressure. And – um the, it's actually a strength to have more people involved. It's right. a strength to have the broader membership active and behind you. And the way it's done right now, it, it opens up all this space for rumors, for conspiracy exactly theories, right. for distrust yep. to foster. That's what exists right now with this secret backdoor negotiating, negotiations. If we're up front and we're not saying these are promises, I promise I, on your behalf, I'm going to win $30 an hour. On your behalf, That's I'm going right. to win an end to mandatory overtime. What we're, fight, we're, we're talking, talking about is the union from the top and if, if necessary, which is, seems necessary, from below we push up and force them to, right. the union says, these are our goals. This is what we're fighting for. These are our demands. Let's fight for that collectively. Right. Th- those exact words, this is what we're fighting for. If you want us to fight, you have to tell us what we're fighting for. <laughs> That's right. That is exactly right. That's right. All right. So moving on to the broader movement now mm-hmm. of build a fighting in ALC where it's no longer just open bargaining. Now yeah. it is a bona fide labor movement. What are the other planks of build a fighting NALC? Yeah, I mean, we have a court. So we have a coordinating committee, and we've come up with. It's not just me. <laughs> there's other people involved right. in this, and we've come up with. Again, we want to come up with a broader program as we develop into a real reform movement or reform caucus within the union, because we want people to know we're not just saying we want change. No, what are we act- What are we fighting for? What are our ideas? And we have an initial five point program, and that's obviously open bargaining. $30 an hour starting wage with raises for all steps after right. that, an end to mandatory overtime, 
a worker's wage for union officers because no one, I mean, I don't think anyone in our union should be making two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000 a year when new hires are making forty or $50,000 a year. Okay. And the right to strike, fighting for the right to strike. Yeah. I love that you're willing to say that forbidden word. Yeah. You know, it. I think it's okay to talk about it. Right now it's not okay to call for it. Yeah. But it's okay to talk about it. That, and, that and, we're, and we're fighting for the we're right. We're fighting for the right. Right. We're not saying we're going to do prote- it. Which we're legally protected yeah. to do that. I yeah. think that people are afraid. I agree. Of it. People are so <laughs> afraid of that word that they don't want to talk about it at all. But it's a reasonable demand. And like you said, demands are not promises. Mm-hmm. You know, we can fight for it. But the point you had right before that is the one I wanted to what, – what was your point number four? The work, a worker's wage for union Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So I really like this. You know, people will make the argument that, oh, what the president or vice president or whatever does is so hard and so uh, time-consuming yeah. that they need more money. Well, for what Renfro makes, you could hire three people to yeah, do that true. job – and he's not doing the work of three people. Sure. You know, and so so it is reasonable to have a more a wage that's more in line with the workers you're fighting for. Exactly. And if there's too much work to be done, well, with the money that we're already spending, we can get more people to do that work. I think that's just the reality is it would it would give the membership a lot more confidence in the union if if we knew if they knew that the, that the leaders are there for to be the best fighters that's for the exactly union possible, right. not there to get a cushy salary, that's exactly and cushy right. position. And once you get that cushy salary, you grow accustomed to it. And now if you're an NBA, if you're a national officer or something like that, now you got this new car, you got this new mortgage, and suddenly the most important thing becomes holding on to that defending, position. Defending that, I mean, right. defending that privilege, defending yep, that position. That's exactly and right. The other thing is, it, it, how can you fully represent the people that you are elected to represent if you don't live the material reality that they live? If you don't live Yep. Under the conditions that they and I you know and people made the argument that well Washington D.C. is an expensive city. I'm sorry, are there letter carriers in Washington D.C.? That's exactly right. That's a rhetorical question. I know there are. Yeah, yeah. And I've met them this weekend. You right. Know, where yeah, do they that, live? That's where exactly do they right. live? Yeah. Probably have to live outside of D.C. because it's too yeah. expensive for them. And but, if you want to include, like, if you have to relocate, you know, you have to be in D.C. for stuff. There could be maybe a stipend for that. Sure. That could be. An I mean, we can work out the kinks, but the yeah. reality is the way it's it's not good. It's not a good look, and it doesn't inspire confidence. That's if exactly someone. Right. Right. Top on top is making so much, so much more. Not right. living the same reality that letter right. carriers are, 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 are living. Not you know doing the work that letter carriers are doing every day. And this doesn't mean. I think people can say like, I think people defend it because they they think. Um, are we saying that their work isn't worth, uh, right. worth worth money? Is their work not not worth it? Do we not respect them in their position? That's not yeah. what this is about. It's about you know. Trying to create a union where everyone is equals here. No one is above anyone else. We call each other brother and sister. We call each other a family. Yep. That's not just words. Right. That's supposed to mean something. Right. And uh, I think we should do everything we can. I mean, also, it's just like the reality is I think we all deserve more pay. You That's know, exactly and so right. if we're all better paid, right. uh, then the, the position, you well, don't know. Don't worry, Tyler. The new contract right around the corner. Yeah, we're well, minutes away. I've been hearing that for a while. Huh? Yeah, yeah. So have I. All right. So the last thing I want to talk about before we sure. get out of here is um, what's the future? Of the BFM. Mm-hmm. I think so. Just to be clear, um, I'm going to ask someone really quick. We're going to do yeah. a, a post convention meeting on August 25th, Sunday, August 25th. We're going to do a, a recap of the convention. You don't have to be a delegate, anyone is welcome. A recap of the convention, but we're also going to put forward the vision for what we see for BFN, for Build a Fighting NELC in the next six months, year. Um, you know, we want to give people some stuff to do. We have people, we want people to join this movement. But what does that look like exactly? Well, we'll be coming out with information about that. But in reality, you know, we have a coordinating committee right now. It's made up of eight members, eight carriers from across the country. We want to also, people want to do stuff in their, in their branches, in their local areas. We want to eventually work towards developing chapters, you know. I, maybe that can start with two people, three people, four people. Can you build that out and create a group? And again, we're not calling for something separate from the union. This is, you're going to fight in your NELC branch, but we want to develop chapters that um, can help push for a fighting approach within the union in local areas as well as a national effort. We're not right. just going to be a national thing where we have meetings every once in a while and we tell people what to do. We want to develop, we want people to help people develop local chapters of BFN in their areas and that exactly how we want that to look like, what that's going to, you know, what, we, what we're going to do with that, we're going to talk about on August 25th. And so I want to encourage everyone to come out to that and, Absolutely. and see that. Tyler, I'm with you, brother. You're doing a great job, and I appreciate the energy you bring into this unit. I appreciate you as well. Thanks for having me on. You got Take care, guys.